His name was David Dorn. Why are cops taking a knee? Secretary of Defense opposes the Insurrection Act's invocation. The left claims looting is not violence. And a voice of righteous indignation, you must hear. Coming up. Welcome to the Buck Sexton Show, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. We are in a troubled point in time in this country. And I think we, we have not yet been, even, uh, been able to take stock of how much damage has been done by the COVID lockdown hysteria. And, and now our cities undermine, law and order undermined in dozens of major population centers across the country. Uh, we're still reeling from all of this. Haven't really had any time to process. National trauma is building up and people are increasingly uh, angry, hysterical, unwilling to listen to reason, to look at facts. These are troubling times. And I'm going to always try to be a voice here of reason and sanity. And that's nothing new, but especially these days, because there's so much that is going on in many of these news items that are coming up and because we're all locked in our homes still pretty much at least here in new york i know some of you have some freedom but you can't really go out to restaurants you can't go out to concerts you're not going to your office the same way you used to in most cases because we still are told to wear masks and there's all of this oppression on us and that's what it is remember this these regulations these determinations by public health experts who should not be trusted again. And we should not have trusted them in the first place to make policy decisions. They should have given recommendations and advice. The keys should not have been handed over to them. Whatever St. Fauci says, we will all bend at the knee and obey. But now we have the country thrown into disarray over a man being killed by a police officer, an African-American man uh, strangled with a knee on the neck in Minneapolis. And we're all really forced. We're, we're not told that we can reflect on this or grieve in our own way or process this or process COVID-19's destruction in our own way. Let me let me be very clear. Uh, you have public health experts uh, NPR put out a story there. The stories are flowing all over the place now. Public health experts who were warning weeks ago that it was reckless to gather in crowds are now making excuses for thousands and thousands of people cramming together in streets uh, of major cities across the country. Oh, this is worth it. That's what they're saying. This is what. So if you have lost your job, lost your business, uh, been driven partially insane by these ridiculous government policies of lockdown um, and had months of your life stolen from you. I, you I, we've had months of our lives stolen from us by government ineptitude and stupidity, months we will never get back. Uh, if, if that was bothersome to you and you wanted to protest, you were a bad person, you were putting lives at risk, you weren't allowed to have that choice. There was no goodwill or good faith extended to you if you wanted to protest the lockdowns. But now we're told by the public health community, oh, it's fine because the fight against racism is so important. Now, yeah, the fight against racism is important. So is the fight against poverty and the fight against violence and the fight against a lot of very broad concepts that certainly have a lot of influence over our day to day lives. But it's not like the fight is new and it's not like it's going to change in a day. And it's not even clear how this is fighting racism. Having people hold up signs, taking selfies and racism now. Defund the defund the police. Silence is violence. That's fighting racism. In what way? I, I would want to know. What human being sees these rallies who does not agree with them already, meaning that does not agree with the underlying concept of racism is bad and say, well, because 
there are rallies of people now walking down the street chanting and and really also let's understand there's and this part of it I completely uh, I, I completely can can sense and, and empathize with people want human contact again. You know, this protest activity, I have been covering left wing protests for years. Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, various anti-cop protests that would pop up after an incident of police involved violence. The, the left, you know, and whether it's May Day stuff going on in Union Square where they bust out the hammer and sickle flags and the, the, the left has created there's a protest culture. And people enjoy it. They like it. And that's fine. It's not my thing. But then again, I was very appreciative of the Tea Party at the time. So, see, I actually have principles. So I can I can say, hold on a second. I'm not going to bash protest as a general form because, one, we have a long and important history of protest. But also, I'm not going to pretend now that I'm, I'm unaware of conservative mass public movements in, in recent years that I agreed with. Now, they were entirely, entirely, not mostly, entirely peaceful. Though there's important distinctions to make here, too. But, yes, I think that protest has an important place in public, uh, public life. I do think that just because you're protesting doesn't mean you have something to say or you're right. So, you know, I reserve the right to make determinations about the worthiness of a protest one way or the other, about the messaging, but not the act itself. The act itself, when it is lawful, is fine. But what you have here is a war on neutral principles that the, the left has been waging for years. They have been trying to tear down. How many times do you hear me talk about how hypocrisy is a defining characteristic of the left? And we see it now with the covid lockdown that that's a perfect example it, protesting the covid lockdown was reckless and terrible for health reasons they say and now oh no the fight against racism is so important we have to allow for this and i will also make a prediction right now perhaps we should mark this down there will not be a big increase in remember you have to mark this by hospitalizations and deaths not by uh, or number of cases because that has to do with number of tests. How many people? By the way, are, are you rushing out to get a COVID test? I mean, I did a couple of weeks ago to see the president, NBD. But you know, are you rushing out to get it? No, of course not. I'm not either. Maybe I'll get a serology test still, but you know, I'm busy. So the number of tests doesn't really make uh, doesn't really tell you what the course of this disease is as a public health concern. But I'm going to make a prediction right now. There's not going to be some big surge in, in serious cases of this after thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been gathering all across the country in urban centers. And do you think that they're then uh, they're going to change and say, well, not only were we unprincipled as public health experts and the mainstream media magnifying this message, and it's all wrapped in anti-Trumpism. We, have, I, you know, it's all wrapped in it. That's all part of this, right? The, the shift in power, the sense of powerlessness that the left has because Trump had so many successful years and they saw this is the opportunity. What, Joe Biden's going to sweep in and do such a, you know, with a normal economy and normal times with, with peace on the streets and people flourishing, you're going to vote for Joe Biden? No, no, I'm sorry. The one or 2% of the electorate that's going to make the difference in the next election is going to look at what's happening in the country. You know, independents, people that can be motivated to go out and vote one way or the other, they're going to say or they were going to say things are, are going really well. So so the country suffering and going badly is in the interests of the institutional and organized left. That's just a fact. It's obvious. So now we have to remember that everything that we're seeing with covid, I'm not saying it's entirely driven by that. Yes, people have been very scared. Yes, there have been. Uh, moments of hysteria and panic. Look, I had a week or two where I was deeply concerned. I also said publicly on Twitter um, 10 days before the 15 days to end the spread. I don't care what the numbers say. We got to get back to work. And I was annihilated on Twitter by the left for that. I was not. Now, that tweet went viral, but I was annihilated. But I was taking a stand. I was saying we got to allow people to have their freedoms back. This is nuts. I'll tell you this right now. Not a lot of conservatives came to my defense there either. 
Not not a lot of con- there were some. There were some and there there have been some people who have been stalwarts all along on this issue. I've had Alex Berenson on the show, uh, but he's not really a conservative. He's just a skeptic of the lockdown consensus. He looked at the numbers, but he was one of those who was leading the charge on this. But uh, John Cardillo, Matt Walsh, my main man, Jesse Kelly, there were people who in the very early stages of this were willing to say, hold on a second. We don't know that we should do this. And this is crazy. A lot of conservatives were, oh, no, have you seen what the numbers say from this place or that place? And, you know, they didn't question anything. And I'm just telling you this. I I didn't get a lot of backup at the time, and I definitely haven't gotten a lot of apologies from the people that said that I was trying to kill grandma. Uh, But so I, I, I see the politics that are involved in all of this. And I also understand, and that's why I'm sympathetic to President Trump, the pressure that he was under as the man making the decisions. It's one thing for me to say, we got to stop this lockdown situation. It's another thing for the president to be pushing with his, you know, hundred thousand times the, you know, the pulpit and the power and the magnitude of his message saying that we shouldn't do this. Um, I, I can understand how when you're told by everybody around you that's looking at this, that's supposed to be an expert. Uh, this is what we're facing, that you would at least bend the knee for a week or two. We'll return to this concept of bending the knee in a second. But the destruction of principle that is happening in this country, and I mean, I mean rules of the road for society that we can all agree on, that if you said something last week and are saying something else this week, you should have to explain why if you're a public figure. You should have to admit that you were either wrong or the data has changed. You can't just engage in this mass campaign of gaslighting. I mean, the media is gaslighting us like it's napalm. They're just destroying any sense of honesty, decency, and again, not all of them, right? This is, it's so difficult to speak of, of movements and of the media and these, because there's always exceptions. There's always good people. There's always the peaceful, the honest, the truthful within these broad designations. But if you're looking, whenever you're talking about policy, you're talking about what affects the general population, what, it, what is generally true. Policy is never always true not of the policy debates that we have not the questions that come up where there are multiple sides and multiple angles and to shut us down from being able to point out what is so obvious because it's not true 100 percent of the time this is a central tactic of the dishonest left right and this is what you get also with the mostly peaceful protest okay as i've said When Abraham Lincoln was at the theater that night, it was most of the night. I mean, almost all of it was a theatrical production where everybody was calm and peaceful and fine. But then someone shot the president of the United States. If you call that mostly a theatrical production, people would think something was wrong with you. But on nights where there's maybe 100 or 200 protesters who gather and they are peaceful But then a portion of them break off and then hundreds of other people join them and they loot and rob and ruin neighborhoods to call that a mostly peaceful protest is dishonest it is dishonest it is a riot that had a protest component before it it's all about where you put the emphasis my friends understand how the left does its propaganda and you'll never be surprised i'm i'm amazed and i i I really run out of adjectives to describe this I, i saying things like i'm amazed i'm shocked i'm appalled uh, the the way that we are expected to go from complete and absolute power in the hands of the authorities to tell you that you must wear a mask, you must wear a stifling, oppressive face covering all the time outside your own home, outside in open air. And in how it became a political symbol, and they were honest about this. And how they could tell you you can't go to a restaurant, you can't open your business, you can't engage in normal activities. They were shutting down parks. These power-mad lunatics were shutting down running trails. And, and now the evidence is in. And it was all nonsense. That was a complete waste of time. And while they were doing that, while they were saying, bend the knee, peasant, Seniors were dying by the thousands and thousands in facilities 
where they were injecting people known to have COVID-19 into the facility because they believed the hysteria about how all the hospitals are going to be overrun. Catastrophic government failure at the state and local level and place after place. And yes, for the first time, they got Donald Trump to go against his instincts and bend the knee and extend this thing a few more weeks. And with that concession, they were able to just run with it. I want you to remember that point. The left seeks to use your inherent goodness. They want to leverage your decency and morality, your willingness to help others, to put yourself out there, and your desire to be good to the left of American politics. That is a weakness to be exploited. They will do it over and over again. I didn't want old people to die because I was coughing in their direction. So, of course, for weeks I was saying, I I guess I have to wash my hands a hundred times a day and go around with a mask on like I'm some kind of a maniac and do all these things. And, And they used a combination of fear and your desire to do good for control. Do you see any parallel that might be happening right now with this this movement put aside even the riots this movement that claims that it's all about ending police racism a movement that does not cite facts and figures that uses slogans to mobilize people that is using people of goodwill on both sides for the purposes of advancing a narrative that is largely false right the narrative of hunting black men for sport by cops that is repeated over and over in the media and at these protests is not supported by the truth. That's not the same thing as saying it does not happen. But it is not a narrative that is rooted in context and truth and data. But we're supposed to go along with just the overall portrait that has been painted here of what American law enforcement is like I am cautioning you do not do not accept the version that is being presented because you don't want to be called a bad person you know what your principles are you know you're not a racist you know that you believe in the human dignity of all of us as equals in God's eyes and you know that law enforcement in this country does a damn good job of protecting us almost all all the time but there are exceptions there are exceptions here in new york i'll get to some of this just want to say if you haven't gotten a chance please go to bucksexton.com we have a piece up there that the president of the united states retweeted among seven other retweets of uh My Twitter account this morning, which I very much appreciate. We've got to get the word out, my friends. We'll be right back. His name was David Dorn. People who knew him called him Cap. David Dorn was 77 years old when he was gunned down yesterday working as security at Lee's Pawn Shop and Jewelry. Here's a man who served his, served his community and by doing so served his country for over 40 years as a police officer. He was known as a kind man, honorable, someone who always showed up, did the job, and... He was killed by one of these looters that are running wild all over the country. David Dorn is an African-American retired law enforcement officer gunned down. Do you think you will see protesters holding up photos of Dorn? Do you think that there will be a call for discussions about community violence? I'm sorry, my friends. I understand there's a lot of pressure and I understand that emotions are high, but we cannot allow people who often have motives that have 
nothing to do with helping the black community. The organized left does not care about minority communities, just a tool for them, a tool for the acquisition of power, of control. We cannot allow the truth not to matter. What is the truth about violence against the black community in America when it comes to police? You had a total last year, according to the Washington Post, of nine, nine unarmed African-American men killed by police, over 10 million arrests in the United States last year. You had considerably higher. I mean, if you want see, there's so many ways to look at numbers and percentages. You had over, I, I, I'm not even sure what the full, it's at least over 200% more unarmed white uh, assailants or, uh, or uh, suspects or victims, depends on what the actual case is. Uh, you had more unarmed white people by a percentage that is quite high killed by cops. But that's not a problem because it, it all just comes back to uh, systemic racism. This is what we're told. It's all about systemic racism. And it's all about the, uh, the oppression within the black community and violence in the black community. And there's, there are these celebrated left-wing authors. We will get to one who just received the Pulitzer Prize for the 1619 Project, which is just a, a, lar- a historical in many respects or, or improper in its usage, wrong in its usage of facts on key issues, but is now being taught to your kids in school. Just remember that. Uh, but she took the position that looting is not violence. Oh, oh, so let's recall that for years now, the journalists have told us the left, the Democrats, and the left and Democrats, I want to be clear, can be used interchangeably. But the left is bigger. You know, all Democrats are on the left, but the left also includes even more extreme non-party elements. Uh, but the, the left, as we know, is seizing this moment, seizing this opportunity. And for years they were telling us that President Trump was a threat to our sacred institutions, our sacred institutions. OK, well. What about the institutions of things like law and order, law enforcement? What about institutions like private property? Those aren't, no? We we just dispense with that the moment that there's a need? You've really been given a window into how extreme and really now, this this is a, this uh, this left mobilization around anti-racism and cop violence is, be, is really a religious movement now. It's not, it's not one that is, uh, that is at its foundation about facts and figures. It is one that is about feelings. And it's one that's about the emotional tumult that people feel, often because of what other people tell them about something. Uh, you know, the for example, when I was at the protest in Times Square, again, covering it, not like walking around with a mask and a placard Uh, I saw a lot of you know 20 something year old white females there for example do do we really think that they have some particular experience or expertise in fighting racism or no but but it emotionally appeals them it makes them feel good to walk around screaming you know and racism okay fine they're allowed to do it but I'm also allowed to think that it's not really worth anyone's time. I'm also allowed to think that this is all worthless virtue signaling, particularly from white liberals who, if you look at the polling, are in recent years more concerned about racism in America than African-Americans are. That tells you something, doesn't it? Uh, But but back to uh, back to David Dorn. And look, I I haven't we, we have. We have audio of this. I, I, I want to play it for you because, you know, the, the imagery and the sounds of what happened to George Floyd have now, we, we all, I mean, I can still hear it. It echoes through your mind. And that factors into the emotional response that we all have. I, you know, I, we, we feel this need to always say it's, it was a horrible thing what happened to him, what was done to him. 
And we all know that. And we've all said it now. I, I, I guess we have to keep you have to keep saying this or, or, or else maybe what you're suspect. You, you all of a sudden don't think that it's a, a, a terrible thing that happened. But but beyond that, um, I think that on our side of the political aisle, broadly speaking, uh, there's a lack of appreciation for how much imagery and and audio can drive emotions, especially in tense periods like this. Uh, here is and, and we should we should hear what's out there and what's going on. So with that, I'll, I'll give you here is 77 year old uh, St. Louis retired police captain cap, as they called him, David Dorn, as he was shot by a looter. Play clip two. Come on, OG, stay with me. Come on, OG. Come on, OG. Come on, OG, stay with me. Come on, OG. Come on, OG. Come on, OG. Come on, OG. Damn, man, I was some TVs, cuz. I was some TVs, man. For real. It's somebody granddaddy, cuz. Man, what you trying? What y'all trying to do? You talking about y'all kidding, man? I was some TVs, cuz. I was some TVs, cuz. You hear me? That's what we could get, cuz. I was some TVs, cuz. That's a man who was with him in his last moments. Another, an African American man who was uh, standing with him and yelling about how this 77 year old, as he said, someone's grandfather, the 77 year old retired law enforcement officer working security at a jewelry store was gunned down. Um, was this, we, we've been told, I've been, you know, and look, it's, it's upsetting. You know, you, you hear it, you understand this is this, what, what happened here is terrible. Um, and yet I, I, I have to remind everybody that we have been told by our media that the looting that has been occurring the looting that is happening all over New York and all over a whole bunch of places, Minneapolis, Atlanta, Boston, L.A., Santa Monica. I mean, all these places. It's because people are angry. Huh. Is that is that a justification? Is that a justification then for gunning down David Dorn? As was pointed out by the bystander who had true righteous indignation at the horrific event that had just transpired, the murder of this man, over some televisions? Does, does the left no longer think that that is worthy of condemnation? Where are the voices on this one? See, this is why they tell us, and I know some of you may disagree with me on, on this one point, but I, I see this as part of a, of a broader struggle between left and right and i'm looking at this from the perspective of what we've just been through with the lockdowns and the politics behind that even though it should have been well beyond politics it was not not even a little bit they tell us oh just just take a knee just show that you are sorry for what happened just do that for us why can't you do that and i say because i don't take orders about my politics, my emotions. I don't take orders from the mob. I don't care what the mob thinks of me. I know my character, my actions. I know what reality is, at least as I, as I experience it. And I know the facts and the data behind these arguments. If they're going to demand that we all, whether it's take a knee or or bend down, and, and really, there, there are these videos going around of, of people, of white people groveling in front of African Americans who are gathered together for this purpose, and perhaps everyone feels like this is healing, but, but I will not grovel before anyone for something that I have not done. I will not grovel before anyone because I am for historic wrongs impugned as an individual. My character is somehow less no. No, that is eroding not just foundational beliefs about America, but about Western civilization, about civilization itself. We are all only responsible for what we as people, as individuals do. I am not responsible for what happened in Minneapolis. And to create these overcomplicated and really 
often impossible to decipher narratives about how some individuals are benefiting from a system in ways that we can't necessarily define or explain. But if you don't concede that, you're part of the problem? No, uh, I, I'm not just going to concede anything. And, and here's what I would say in response to what I know a lot of the objections this would be. Uh, I will bend the knee to these protesters uh, when I think that honor, character, and dignity demand it. And, and at no other time. And maybe if, if they want to start to win me over in some way to their cause, which, as we all know, they're not even sure of what the cause is. People will all start to offer it up because otherwise this is just a lot of a lot of noise, a lot of emotion, but it doesn't change anything. Right. So you're going to have groups here and they're Oh, we want police reform in this way or that way. Also not. Guess what? There are going to be a few people of all races killed next year by the cops. It's going to happen that they can tell you. Nine people, that, that's a stunning statistic. Only nine people who are African-American and unarmed killed by the police. I, I think cops are doing a remarkably good job of not being you know, homicidal racist maniacs. But that's the story that you hear. It's just completely divorced from reality. And so I understand you wanna, we want to heal, we want to heal. But notice the healing has to be on the left's terms. Do you think that there will be a moment of silence? There was a nine minute long moment of silence. I think I saw this one was in Washington, D.C. Everyone lying down for nine minutes in quiet to signify the nine minutes in which George Floyd was uh, strangled to death by a police officer with his knee or asphyxiated to death. Uh, do you think that there will be a moment of silence for somebody who is a uh, a, a well-respected hero in his community, someone who served his community, put his life on the line for over 40 years, who's just gunned down by a looter, gunned down by a thug. W will there be any, these protests that are so, he's African, the man shot is African-American, killed. Why isn't he a symbol? Why isn't he a hero? Ask the questions you know you need to ask. Do not let those who do not share not just your politics, but your principles determine how we have this conversation. It's a trap. And I see conservatives falling into it. I see people saying just just a little bit. Just just give them a little bit. No, no. Racism is bad. Police violence is bad. We've established this. We're in agreement on this. The man who was guilty of, of killing George Floyd is already facing murder charges. The system is, in fact, working. So what are they talking about? If they demand a perfect system, then they are demanding the impossible. And if they're going to hold us hostage to impossible demands, this isn't about reform. This is about controlling us. Do not let them dictate the terms of the debate, my friends. You will not like the outcome. My friends, we all know that maxim that those who do not know history are condemned to repeat it, right? We've, we've, all, we've learned this at a very young age, and we know it's true, and yet we don't necessarily pay enough attention to it. What did we see with the debate over COVID-19? We saw moral blackmail, we saw hyper-emotionalism, and we saw a, a, what was supposed to be a non-political movement clearly operating as a really authoritarian political movement. And we got swept up in it. And some of us, I wish I had a louder voice. I wish I had more places that people could hear me. Because everything that I've been saying for the last two months has stood up very well over time. And a lot of other folks, even on the right, not so much. Not so much. Um, but then that brings me to what I'm seeing now. While many of us are supposed to focus on just, oh, the, the peaceful protest, the peaceful protest, we've already, there is no separation on the mainstream right, conservative ideology, the Republican Party. There's no separation on the issue of peaceful protests, police violence, wanting, wanting justice for the George, uh, George Floyd's family. There's no separation. So what is all this other, this other stuff is, no, you also have to accept these sweeping narratives of white privilege, of, of white supremacy as an evil that is 
holding down people across the country and one in which we are all complicit, if you're white, even if you haven't done anything. You have to apologize for things you have not done. Apologize for white supremacy. I, I, I know I only apologize. I only feel remorse for things that I have done that are wrong. I, I, I do not care what other people that have nothing to do with me have done. We have to maintain these intellectual barriers. We have to maintain these places where we cannot let them dictate how we speak, what we think, what we say about all of these issues. It's happening right now. The left sees an opening to make you agree with things that you do not agree with and to ignore the things that you do. The universal principles, the universal human dignity. We all reject racism. Why am I always being told about how people need to reject racism when we all reject racism?